this is week seven here of our scientist chest. It's been a pretty, pretty good ride so far. Hope everyone's been enjoying it. Thank you for your feedback and thank you for joining us each and every week. So everyone may know that all, all attendees on the, on the VHO 13 are advised to please have a guardian or so parent uh, there supervising them, as well as this session is being recorded. So the reason behind us doing this for the past few weeks is in support of the Let's Talk Science Challenge. Uh, this week, the challenge will be taking place on Thursday, which is May 28th. And as usual, there are both English and French versions of the quiz. So this week, we'll be looking at chemistry. So we'll be covering topics such as states of matter and various types of gas laws, as well as the kinetic molecular theory of gases. So if you just take a little look at the website, it's looking at the various states of matter, the ones that most of us may know, solids, liquids, and gases. I won't go too much into this because I know our guest today will be covering a bit of that. As well as various types of gas laws that many of you may have come across depending on what grade you're in so far. So, won't take up too much time with the uh, presentation today. What I would like to do is introduce our speaker or guest, Dr. Stephanie McQuarrie, who is a chemistry professor at Cape Breton University. Uh, she's a researcher in biochar, which is very, very fascinating. Let me go over a bit of that today, as well as a former Subbuck Science speaker. Uh, Dr. McQuarrie did her BSc at Mount Allison University, as well as the PhD from Virginia Tech. And I uh, think that's very, very interesting. And I would like uh, right now to welcome <laughs> Dr. McQuarrie. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adisa. Okay, I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. <laughs> Continue. So, there we go. Um, first, I would like to thank you for inviting me to be a researcher on the Let's Talk Science Challenge with Sci Exchange at Ryerson. It's super exciting to see all the people that have logged on to talk a little bit about the Let's Talk Science topics in chemistry, my favorite subject, and uh, hear a little bit about my research program at CBU. Um, <clears throat> before I get into that, though I want to tell you a little bit about me and who I am. So I was born in Nova Scotia, so I'm a Canadian. Um, I grew up in, in the Maritimes in Truro, Nova Scotia. And when I was young, I was famous for my role in a boathouse band. I played where I played the badminton, as you can see in this picture here. Um, but I didn't pursue my career in music. I went on to Mount Allison University, uh, which is in New Brunswick. <clears throat> and that's where I did my bachelor of science degree. And that's really truly where I figured out that I loved chemistry and I wanted to do something in chemistry for the rest of my life. Now I'm going to be honest with you, I really didn't like first year chemistry and I didn't love high school chemistry, but I loved organic chemistry. When I took organic chemistry, it was challenging and difficult, but it totally made sense and I just fell in love with it and I knew that's what I wanted to do somehow for the rest of my life. So the next step for me was to go to um, Virginia tech to do my PhD. So I went to the States um, because it was an opportunity to go to a different country and do graduate studies. And I went from a school of about 3,000 people, which was Mount Allison, to a school of more than 30,000 people at Virginia Tech. So it was a huge leap, but it was fun and amazing. And during my time when I was just finishing up my PhD at Virginia Tech, I had my first child, Brayden. Brayden's 15 now, and he's in the other room listening. Um, after I finished my PhD at Virginia Tech, I, went, I came back to Canada and uh, moved to Ontario to um, do my postdoc at Queen's University. So a postdoc is like, it's sort of like your first job in academia or in academics. I didn't, I guess it was at Virginia Tech that I decided I wanted to teach chemistry and be a chemistry professor. Um, so I knew I'd have to do a postdoc and I wanted to come back to Canada. So I was lucky enough to get a position at Queen's University in, in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, from there, I, I worked yeah. at Queen's for about four years, and then um, in 2009, I got a position at Cape Breton University in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, where I was 
um, where I took a position as an assistant professor of organic chemistry. And in the same year, I had my second child, Sophie, and she's 10 now. So during that time, I, I'm still at CBU, and during that time, I had um, one more child, Lila, and they're all in the other room listening to me right now and probably embarrassed that I put baby pictures off of them. Um, and I've been promoted to associate professor of organic chemistry, and I'm also the associate dean of science and technology at CBU. So I have a wonderful family of five. We spend a lot of time enjoying the outside of uh, Cape Breton and what there is to offer here. And we have one furry friend in our family named Lucy at this time. So where's Cape Breton? I'm sorry if you are not logging in from anywhere from Manitoba over to Nova Scotia or Newfoundland and I've cut you off of this screen. Um, but I realize a lot of the, the, the students or kids or families that have logged in today are probably from all across Canada. And you might not have ever been able to travel to Nova Scotia and you may have never been able to go to Cape Breton. So I wanted to show you exactly where I'm located. So Cape Breton is the sort of the little island off of the coast of Nova Scotia here, off the top um, northeastern coast. And Sydney, Nova Scotia, is where Cape Breton University is and that, that's on sort of the eastern side of the island here. It's very beautiful here. Um, it's an island, so obviously we're surrounded by the ocean. Uh, but it's also very mountainous and we have a lot of forest as well, which is important for this talk. So if you have a chance to come to Cape Breton when we're allowed to move about our country again, then please do come visit us. So what I'm going to talk about is how, what is, um, what's the matter with waste is the topic of my talk today or, or my presentation. And so the first thing I have to talk about is what is matter and that somebody had actually sent that question in as a pre-question for this talk today. And the answer to that is super easy because it's literally everything, like every single thing around you is matter. It's the food that you ate for lunch or if you're enjoying a bo uh, bowl of popcorn right now, it's the popcorn you're eating and it's the bowl the popcorn's in. It's the computer that you're looking, uh, watching me in right now. It's everything around you. It's the air that you're breathing. Everything is matter. Matter is actually defined as anything that has a mass and takes up space or has a volume, okay? So anything that has a mass or has a volume. Matter is actually made up of atoms and compounds. And so atoms are, and compounds come from the elements of the periodic table. So this is my favorite, um, favorite thing ever, the periodic table. I particularly like this version of it. And in the chat, you should have a link to um, explore this version as well. I'm gonna click on it and see if we can go there. This version of the periodic table is an interactive version. So hopefully you're seeing that pop up on your screen as well. And what I love about this is it lets you roll over the elements and click on your favorite ones to figure out, to find information about um, that particular element. So my favorite element is carbon. If I click on carbon, a Wikipedia site comes up and it tells me everything I ever wanted to know about carbon. And carbon is one of the most important elements for life and uh, also related to my research program. So I really like the element carbon, but you can sort of scroll through and find out everything you could possibly want to know about carbon. Um, and you can do that with any of the elements on, the, on, the, uh, on, that, on that interactive periodic table. So the periodic table is kind of like a table of Lego blocks and each of the blocks um, is capable of acting alone and on its own it's known as an element and the elements are made up of atoms of that particular um, uh, of a particular type but we can also take some of these blocks like we could take a carbon atom out and we could make uh, bonds or links to other atoms like hydrogen for example so we can take one carbon atom and because of the properties of carbon we can bond it to four hydrogen atoms so it's almost like using the periodic table as a as a collection of Lego blocks where you can take them apart and, and make new co compounds or new uh, molecules by combining them back together. <clears throat> so atoms are the, the smallest particle that allow us to understand um, the periodic table of elements. And actually some people even call it the periodic table of atoms because the elements are just atoms that have different numbers of um, protons and, and uh, electrons and neutrons. And so an atom looks something like this. Now remember, these are just models that allow us to understand how, um, how things work in the physical world, how molecules behave, how elements exist. But if we pretend that this is what an atom looks like, it sort of gives us a general idea of what and how an atom exists. So the center of the atom is called the nucleus. 
And in the nucleus, we have neutrons and there's no charge. Those are just particles with no charge and those are shown as red. And then we have protons and they exist in the nucleus with the neutrons. So the protons and the neutrons are together in the middle of the atom. And then the electrons, they swirl around the outside of the atom, okay? And they're negatively charged. And depending on which atom you're looking at, this is a carbon atom and it has four electrons. Um, it'll have a different number of sort of loops that go around the atom. And we call these the, um, these are called the orbitals, okay? These are the orbitals that the electrons exist in. And I personally like the electrons the best because that's what makes the elements interesting. That's what makes the elements do things. That's why they react and, and do chemical reactions and make bonds with other things. And so this second um, image here is just kind of showing you that it's not a one-dimensional structure. The atom is not in one dimension, it's in three dimensions. And so the electrons are moving in these kind of spheres or clouds or ovals around the center of the atom, which, contain, which is the nucleus containing the neutrons and the protons. And so that is the, um, the general idea of what matter is. So matter is ev everything that has mass and takes up volume or takes up space. And matter is composed of atoms that are that make up the elements and the elements can combine and make compounds and can make molecules and that makes everything so that's what you that's how you build it okay so the earth um there's lots and lots of states of matter in the universe some states of matter we don't even know about yet and as scientists explore the universe they'll they'll learn about these new states of matter but on earth we have only a, a um we only have a few states of matter and I wanted to share with you a Zoom poll to see if, if you out there listening know how many states of matter exist on Earth. Now I'm talking about all the possible states of matter that exist on Earth, not just the ones that are here naturally, but all the ones we've even created. Okay, so mostly people are choosing five states of matter. Some people are choosing three states of matter. And that's actually very interesting. Because in school, when you're learning about the states of matter, you probably learn about those three states of matter. Right? So you learn about three states of matter. But there's actually five states of matter on Earth. Okay, so the three states of matter that you learned about in school are probably solids, liquids and gas, like about 33% uh, of people said. Um, but there is two other states of matter that exist on Earth called plasmas and BE condensates or Boyce-Einstein condensates. Now, you may have not learned about these two states of matter in your, in your schoolwork yet because we mostly focus on solids, liquids, and gases because the other two states of matter are quite unusual and a lot different than um, the main three. So let's start with the main three. Okay. Solids are the first one we're gonna talk about because solids are kind of boring. They're the lowest energy state of matter. The molecules are very organized, okay? See in this image here, the, the molecules are the atoms, depending on what the solid is, are organized in kind of in a block fashion here. And you can see from this little wiggly image that the atoms are vibrating and moving and all matter um, vibrates and moves in some way, shape or form, wiggling around. Okay, so in solids, the molecules wiggle around very, very slightly and very slowly. And there's not a lot of energy here. So this is the lowest energy form of a solid. And the other unique thing about solids is that they retain their shape. Okay, they don't take the shape of the flask or the container that you put them in. So for example, if you go to your fridge and you pull out an ice cube and you put it in a glass, the, the ice cube doesn't immediately take the shape of the glass, right? Um, it stays as the shape of the ice cube that you put in the glass until it melts. Liquids, however, are a little bit more disorganized. They have a little bit more energy, and so they move around a little faster. Um, they can slide by each other, and they have a lot more what's called molecular motion. There's various gaps or spaces between the atoms or the molecules that make up the liquid. And um, while you can compress the liquid or squish it together a little bit, it's still pretty dense, so it still takes up all the space it possibly can take up. Liquids do conform to their, the shape of the container that you put them in. So if you go to the fridge and you pour yourself a glass of 
almond milk, the almond milk stays in the shape of the glass that you've poured it in, right? It doesn't just pour into a nice little column in the center. Um, so that's a unique feature of liquids. They take the shape of the container that you pour them into. And the molecules are moving around a little bit more. They have more energy. If we give the molecules even a little bit more energy, then we make the state of matter called a gas. So gas molecules have a lot more energy than, the liqu than liquid molecules do, or liquid atoms. And they're still very disorganized, and they move around a lot more. So they bump into each other, they collide, but there's a lot more space in between the atoms or the molecules of a gas. Um, and a lot more free space. So these are the three states of matter that you're probably the most familiar with. Just to review, solids have the least amount of energy, they're the most organized, they retain the shape of the solid. Liquids have a little bit more energy, the mo molecules move around a little bit more, shake around a little bit more, um, slide past each other a little bit more, and they retain the shape of whatever container you put them in. And a gas, well, gas molecules have a lot more energy, they move around a lot more, they, they have a lot more space between them and they're very disorganized. Okay, so the next state of matter is called a plasma. So you might be familiar with plasmas if you've ever been fortunate enough to see the Northern Lights or if you um, have seen uh, ball lightning or have one of those balls that you can create a plasma in by um, putting your fingertips on it and creating an electric field. <clears throat> but they're very, they're very uncommon and it takes very special conditions to create a plasma on Earth. So we can create plasmas on Earth and they do, they do occur naturally on Earth, um, but they're not as common as the other uh, states of matter in our everyday life. They're unique from the other states of matter um, and they're, they're similar to a gas, but they're different than a gas. So the best way to describe this is if we think of neon. So neon atoms can exist as a gas. And so on the left side of the screen, we have a neon atom with its nucleus having neutrons and, and protons in the middle and all the electrons around it. And these electrons in the neon gas atom, they're stuck to the atom, okay? So they, they're there and they're moving around, but they are really connected and stuck to that neon atom itself. In a plasma, those electrons just take off. They go wherever they want. They can move around freely through the atoms, okay? So you have electrons that are moving around more freely through the space and through the system. And so the way we define a plasma, it's made of groups of positively and negatively charged particles, not necessarily atoms that have their, neat, their protons, neutrons, and electrons neatly compacted onto the atom. Um, plasmas are super excited and oftentimes very, very hot. So the molecules in a plasma are really, the molecules or atoms or electrons or particles of a, a plasma are really, really, really super excited and have a lot of energy. Okay, the next kind of, of state of matter that we're gonna talk about is the only matter that has been created while your parents were alive. So this is a type of matter that was created in 1995 called the BE condensates or Boyce-Einstein condensates. Um, they were, it was created by two scientists named Cornell and Wyman and they finally created this condensate uh, that is a different form of matter than the other four states we've already talked about after a lot of uh, many, many, many years of work. So actually it was predicted by Boyce and Einstein in 1920 that there could be another state of matter created on Earth um, if we were able to take atoms that typically have, that always have molecular motion and remove all of the energy from the atoms. Okay, so that would form a new, new kind of matter if we could remove all the energy from the atoms and stop their motion completely. But in the 1920s, there were no like really awesome scientific labs that could do this kind of work, that could do this kind of physics that was required to remove all the energy from an atom. Before we talk about the actual uh, Boyce-Einstein condensates themselves as a form of matter, I want to just um, remind you or tell you about a new, a different kind of temperature scale that we talk about when we're talking about matter and we often use in chemistry, and that's called the Kelvin scale. So we all know water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, and that's typically how we refer to temperature uh, in everyday life. But in chemistry and in science, we say that is 273 degrees Kelvin. So 273 degrees Kelvin is the temperature at which water freezes, zero degrees Celsius. Oops, I'm gonna go back. Water boils at 100 degrees higher 
higher than zero degrees, so at 100 degrees Celsius or 373 degrees Kelvin, water's boiling. And remember, water is, um, water molecules are having less energy and moving pretty slowly when they're frozen, right? But as the water boils and starts to evaporate into a gas, they get more energy and they move around a lot faster. And so what do you think happens if we remove more and more and more of that energy as a form of heat? Eventually, at absolute zero, all the molecules will stop, all atoms and all particles will stop moving, okay? There's, there's no more molecular motion at absolute zero. Absolute zero is absolutely impossible to uh, create because the, the laws of physics and how we understand quantum mechanics goes right out the window and we can't um, actually create absolute zero on Earth. But with amazing technologies, um, scientists have been able to get as low as, a, um, what is it, a tenth of a billionth of a degree, a few billionths of a degree above absolute zero. So very, very close. So uh, Wyman and Cornell took rubidium off the, uh, as an atom off the periodic table, and they used these really cool special lasers to remove as much heat as they could from the rubidium atoms. And then the rubidium atoms that didn't cooperate, that were being kind of annoying and hanging on to their energy, they put those into a special magnetic field and selectively removed them from the um, sample that they were, they were trying to get to go to absolute zero. And when they were successful, when they were able to do that and, and remove as much energy as, as physically and humanly possible from the rubidium atoms, the rubidium atoms changed their state of matter. They formed this giant clump. Okay, so they basically started clumping together and stopped moving. And they formed one big blob of rubidium. And so the best way to understand the boys einstein condensates is that they're a form of matter where the amount of molecular motion that exists in that matter is so small that basically atoms no longer exist as single atoms, but rather as clumps of one kind of particle or material. Okay. So we know that matter can change between its states. And we've talked a little bit about how that happens with energy. And, and normally on Earth and, and in your science classes and even in university, we talk about energy as a form of heat. Heat is the form of energy that we use to change the states of matter. The best example is, of course, when we take an ice cube. If we heat it up, it turns into a liquid. And so we're taking the solid molecules of the ice uh, the water molecules and we're giving them energy and they're breaking apart from each other. They're breaking those forces that keep them together in the nice compact ice cube form. They're breaking apart and they're moving farther away and they have more energy and they sort of, they take up more space. Then um, if we give that liquid even, and that's called going from a solid to a liquid is called melting. Sometimes we call it fusion. Um, oops. And that's the scientific term. So going from a solid to a liquid is called melting. Then if we take that liquid and, and it's, let's say we're still talking about water and we give it even more energy, then we can make those liquid molecules that still have some order and are still fairly close together, but have a little bit more motion. We can give them more energy to move further apart and they become a gas. And that's called um, vaporization. So liquid to gas is vaporization. And of course, being from Canada, we all know that liquids can also turn into solids and you get snow. Um, and that process is called freezing. So a liquid, we can take a liquid and we can remove the heat from it. So um, that's how we always talk about things in terms of um, heating up and cooling down. But the cooling down process is actually just removing heat. So we take the liquid and we take the energy from the liquid molecules. They start to organize themselves again again and get closer together and there's these forces called intermolecular forces that make the uh, uh, molecules of water want to stay connected so they get colder and colder and closer and closer and they stay connected and that's called freezing. Um, condensation is when we go from a gas to a liquid so you've probably done maybe an experiment like this in science camp or at home or in school where you've taken a bag baggie of water you could do this at home now if you want you fill a baggie of water with with about maybe a quarter of an inch of water in it and you tape it up and you, you um, tape it to a warm window in your house. And over time, what you'll, have, what you'll start to see is that the water molecules will start to evaporate and then form um, a gas. And then the gas will start to cool down and form a condensate. So when the gas molecules re-cool down in the evenings or when the weather gets a little bit cooler, they go back into forming a liquid and that's called condensation. Two types of changes of state of matter you may not have heard of, or you might not be as familiar with, are sublimation and deposition. 
So sublimation is going directly from a solid to a gas. And the best example of this is uh, dry ice. So you probably have heard of dry ice. It's the dry ice is a solid carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide likes to be a gas. That's its natural state on Earth. But if you take those gas molecules that are pretty far apart from each other and you provide a lot of pressure and you take out the energy um, of the system, you can actually make those gas molecules become a solid. But they want to be a gas in their natural state. So if you take a block of dry ice out, and you set it on your desk, it doesn't go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, it goes directly from the solid back to the gas state, because that's what those molecules want to be. They want to be a gas. Deposition is when a gas goes back directly to a solid. And we are all familiar with this process, especially living in Canada and especially experiencing our spring in the Maritimes. And that is something that you might be familiar with in terms of the process of frost. So, um, water molecules that exist in the air as a vapor um, in, in the spring often when the temperature drops really, really quickly can form water crystals on the leaves of plants and that's called frost and that's the process of deposition where the water molecules are depositing on the leaves as a solid rather than going from a gas to a liquid to a solid. So they sort of skip this middle phase of becoming a liquid. Okay, so those are the uh, that pretty much covers the topic of matter. There's lots more we could talk about, but I also want to talk a little bit about my research. So remember the title of my talk is What's the Matter with Waste? Well, we have to discuss a little bit about waste. Now, you probably are all really sick and tired of taking out the garbage because you're not in school. So every day at lunch, your mom says, can you please take the garbage out or the trash out? Well, that is also considered waste. And you know, you take the garbage out to your garage and hopefully you recycle a lot of what you, what you um, waste in your house. And, and sometimes some of it's biodegradable or compostable, so you put it in the compost. But most of us end up with one or two bags of, of trash or waste that go to landfills at the end of, of the week on a Friday or something like that. Um, so I have a question for you. What do you think in North America makes up the majority of the garbage or waste that we throw away into our landfills? Yeah, so I, I was like totally the same as you. I was completely on board with most of the majority of you picking plastic because that's what we hear about in the news, right? You're probably not going to believe this, but it's paper. Paper makes up the majority, paper products make up the majority of waste in our landfills in North America, which is absolutely crazy. Plastic is, is, paper is not as bad as plastic because paper can eventually biodegrade and it's not as harsh as plastic on the landfills. And plastic certainly a second, if not getting close to be the first um, major problem of our landfills. But paper actually makes up the majority of the waste that goes to our landfills still. Um, so where does paper come from? Paper comes from trees. And actually Canada, has one of the largest areas of certified forest land in the world. It has 161 million hectare of forest. And so Canada is actually well known for its paper making um, in the world. And actually Ontario, Nova Scotia and Quebec are the number one paper producers in Canada. Um, so what's 161 million hectare? I was trying to get my head wrapped around what this size looks like. One hectare is about the same size as one football field. We're, so we're talking about 161 million football fields worth of forests in Canada. And so forest, as I showed you in my picture of Cape Breton, is a really important industry for Canada. And making paper is really, really important because we use paper every day for lots of things you might not even think of. So how is paper made? Well, you have probably seen news articles that show these, these images of pulp and paper um, industries pumping out pollutants and uh, the process is and can be quite polluting but there's lots of standards that are uh, implemented now to prevent the um, you know pollution of the air and pollution of the waterways near pulp and paper mills. The process that happens inside these mills looks like this. So you start with trees that the um, that is that are uh, deforested, not deforested, that are removed from the forest in a process that is not deforestation. So the process of collecting timber and wood um, from forests in Canada is really important. 
because forests have to be managed. With 161 million hectares of forest in Canada, if we just let the forest grow unmanaged, we end up with things like forest fires being very, very common um, because there's no forest management. So if we do need to, to remove trees from forests and use them as a resource, and we have to do so responsibly and carefully. During this process of, of collecting timber, collecting wood from, um, from the forest, we generate a lot of waste. So the trees are cut down, but the leaves and the branches are left on the forest floor. Some of those leaves and branches are really important to put nutrients back into the forest floor, but a lot of it just sits there and degrades, biodegrades, and through the process of biodegrading, it creates greenhouse gases like CO2 that are emitted back into the atmosphere. Um, the wood that is turned into paper has to be debarked. So pulp and paper mills often have these large areas of piles of bark that are not used. They're considered waste and they just sit there and biodegrade and create CO2. The chipping process, so that when you take the, the debarked logs and break them up into chips and little smaller pieces of wood often creates excess chipped wood, which biodegrades and sits there as a waste. So when I see um, a pulp and paper mill creating paper, I see like all these possible streams of, of material that we could make something better out of than just sitting there letting it decompose. In the pulp and paper process, there's mechanical, chemical, and, um, and physical pulping methods, depending on the kind of proce paper processing that's happening at that particular mill. And there's usually some kind of like bleaching to get rid of the wood color. Um, the pulp that's extracted from the trees is mixed with water, and then it's dehydrated and screened and sort of pumped out as a paper. That's how paper's made. But the important part of this slide to me is that there are so many processes of the pulp and paper industry that generate what they consider forestry waste. In our lab, we don't call it waste, we call it forest gold. So we could have piles of bark, piles of branches and leaves and stems, we can have leftover timber or logs that are not being used to make paper. And we do something really important with all of this forest gold or forest waste. We burn it. So you might be thinking, well, that's ridiculous. Burning it is not important. And we don't burn it, like we don't take it home and make a fire and burn it in our backyard. We burn it using a very special process called pyrolysis. Before I explain what that process is, I just wanna um, give a thumbs up or, you know, Prop, props to my uh, group here. These are the researchers that work in my group and they're even working from home right now that do all the research at CBU with me. Most of these are undergraduate students and um, Dr. Irwin has been in our lab for a long time. He builds all the stuff that we need to, to specially burn these kinds of um, waste streams or forestry residues for us. So we use pyrolysis. Now we have in our lab three different ways to burn the forestry waste, um, but they all look different if you just look at them, um, but inside they all work basically the same and inside they all work sort of like what's shown here in this diagram. So we take our feed stock and for us that sometimes is forestry waste, but we also use fisheries waste as well. You can imagine how yummy that smells. Um, we have to dry it. So we remove the water first and then we put it into our pyrolysis unit. That's where the feed stock goes in. We use um, energy in the form of heat to burn the, to burn the um, forestry residues. Now there's no oxygen present in this system. So this system is purged with either inert gas or the gases that are produced through the process go back around and recycle through the system. So you don't have any oxygen present and that's important because if you burn in the presence of oxygen, you get complete combustion and we don't want that. We wanna make the three different forms of matter from our forestry residue. So by burning it, we make the three different forms of matter that we can then collect with our special pyrolysis unit. We make gas molecules that you can see in this sort of mixture here, they're the light blue ones. Those gas molecules are made up of this really small molecules that get let go during the burning process. So those might be things like um, methane and hydrogen and CO2 and small carbon hydrogen molecules that are made of, of mostly carbon hydrogen called hydrocarbons. And then we get some medium sized ones that are sort of the yellowy purple colored. And those, um, and then we get the particles that can't be turned into a gas or a liquid. And those molecules are the solids and those solids are collected um, before the gas and the bigger medium sized molecules move over to the next part. In the next part, the gas molecules are pumped off and recollected. 
and the liquid molecules are condensed and collected in as a bio oil. Okay, so just to review that, we get the three forms of matter. We get the gases collected as the blue particles, the, and those are the smallest molecules. We get the medium-sized molecules collected as a liquid. So the gas is condensed. Some of the medium-sized molecules get collected as a liquid. That's called bio oil. And then we collect the solids that can't be broken up into a liquid or a gas as the biochar or the char collection. And we use each of these products to make each of these materials or each of these mat types of matter to make new products from something that was just going to sit in the ground and decompose. So we use heat as our source of energy and we're going to take a look at bio oil first. So the bio oils that are produced are kind of like a black tarry liquid and they're made up of a whole bunch of different, oops, too fast. A whole bunch of different molecules and depending on what kind of forestry waste you use sometimes you use softwood or hardwood con um, coniferous or deciduous trees um, if you live someplace really warm you might use palm trees and depending on the kind of trees that you're using um, forestry waste that you're using you're going to have different kinds of organic medium and uh, smaller sized organic molecules like the ones shown here in your bio oil but what's really cool is that all of these organic molecules shown here, they're very important molecules that are used in the production of a lot of different things. So for example, we could use the mixture as is in the production of cement and steel or glass or other materials, or we could just burn it as a kind of fuel in a boiler instead of using fossil fuels. Or we can separate each of these components out. So for example, the acid that's shown here, acetic acid, this is a compound that's used to make your salt and vinegar chips. And we, we currently make that compound, acetic acid, from fossil fuels. But when we use up all our fossil fuels on Earth, we're going to need resources to make these compounds or extract these compounds from other resources. And we can actually get quite a lot of acetic acid from wood. Acetic acid has a lot of other really important uses as well in the pharmaceutical industry to make medicines. Um, in the food industry, in the plastic industry to make toys and, and electronics, there's lots of uses. The other uh, type of matter that we make is the gas. So in our units, we actually recycle the gas around the unit and burn it again. So it's our source of energy to heat up our pyrolysis unit. But in other units, you can collect the gas outside of the unit and use it for different things. So the types of gases that we're um, collecting are carbon dioxide, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane. And these molecules, although you hear a lot of bad things about carbon dioxide, it's a really important molecule on Earth, and we make a lot of things out of it um, on Earth. So we use it in the generation of plastics. We use it in the generation of medicine. Um, uh, it's used in the generation of, of food products, for example, in the food industry. And so being able to collect and store these gases is really important because we can then use them to make other, other products out of them. And it's not coming from um, fossil fuels again. And the final one, the one that our lab really focuses on, is the char. So this is where my research group is focused. It's the collection of the biochar, the charcoal, and what we can do with that solid material. So biochar is mostly made up of the element carbon, okay? So it's mostly made up of carbon, but depends on what you make it out of. So when we make a forestry biochar, we have mostly carbon and some oxygen. Um, sometimes we have, we have a lot of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Um, and sometimes we have a little bit of nitrogen in there as well. But most, it looks like this black, you know, black solid material, if you were lucky enough to have a fire before the fire ban happened in Nova Scotia, um, you could go to your fire pit and pick up some of that charcoal that's left over. That is biochar, but it was produced in the, in the presence of oxygen while the stuff we make is not. And if you are lucky to have a really powerful microscope and you zoom in on this biochar, what you see looks like this image down here on the far right. This is a scanning electron microscopy image and it shows you, if you zoom really, really, really far in, um, what the porous structure of the biochar actually looks like. So biochar has these holes in it. It almost looks like a sponge, right? So it's kind of like a molecular sponge. It has big holes and little holes. It has, this one's about 100 micrometers. So that's very, very small. Um, and some of them are only as small as 10 micrometers. This little green bar down here is just a 10 micrometer bar. 
and there's pores that go in between the walls. And, and so you can imagine that on the molecular scale, this biochar might have a lot of value in terms of being able to suck things up or hold on to things if it acts like a sponge. What biochar actually looks like is actually really quite complicated because it's a solid. It's definitely made of these big particles of material, like these big, large um, connected molecules. And sometimes there'll be oxygen there that is sort of outside the ring and sometimes inside the ring, depending on the biomass that you use, you might have nitrogen. Um, but the structure is really complicated and it's different depending on the kind of biomass that you start with. And these are another, these are two more microscope images that show the pores that run down the side. So you can again kind of see, it kind of almost looks like a, um, tunnels that go down the sides of the walls of the biochar. And the bottom image is actually a transmission electron microscope. So this is, this is 60 micron in the top image. That's the scale, 60 micrometers. The bottom image is 100 nanometers. So that's very, very, very small. And what that shows is that if you can get a particle small enough, you can actually see these flat sheets of what are graphene. So this, this um, really flat looking structure here where all the rings look connected and ordered, that's graphene and that's a really important material that is really, really super strong and used in a lot of um, materials like electronics. And in our biochar, we get these sheets of graphene as well. So we have been working in the field of biochar um, for the last 10 years, and we're doing all kinds of really cool, fun stuff with it. Basically, if you say, can you do this with biochar? We say, we will try. Um, so because you make it from, from a waste stream, you're making it basically from garbage, and then you can make it do all these really cool things. So we've spent time looking at whether we can use it as a molecular sponge to remove really gross stuff like lead and mercury from mine water um, or remove pesticides from farmers' water um, if they have a big farm fields and things like that. Um, we've looked at it in water purification systems, so putting it into a filter to remove dirty things like iron and manganese, which is, was a local issue um, for some local drinking water and wells. We had a lot of iron and manganese. Uh, we look at, we've looked at it in agriculture, so addition of biochar to the soil can help generate these little tiny macroscopic homes for microbes to live in and plants like microbes because they help promote healthy plants. Um, and so the biochar actually provides these little homes for the microbes to live in and it can enhance uh, plant growth. We've done some research in this. We've actually done some research in makeup and soaps where we can use the biochar, which is kind of coarse and, and hard as um, an abrasive or like rough material in a soap. So you might remember, I don't know if you're old enough, but a couple of years ago, microbeads were banned from all cosmetics and microbeads are these little plastics that were put into your soaps and stuff to make that like rough feeling, get, get rid of the dry skin. Those were banned in, in Canada. Um, but that abrasive nature of the soap is really good to get rid of your dead skin and promote healthy skin. And so replacing that with biochar is actually beneficial because you're not putting plastic in your soaps anymore, but um, you still get that abrasive quality. So we've done some research in that. Um, we've looked at it as an energy source. The oils that you create during the process of pyrolysis can be burned, um, but you can also burn the biochar as a, um, a source of, of fuel. So if you have an old charcoal barbecue, those briquettes that you put in and light on fire, those are made of biochar. And we do some really cool stuff where we take the biochar and, the, and we manually um, and chemically change the surface chemistry. So we make, well, for example, we've been able to put, we've been able to install special sulfur compounds on the surface of the biochar so that it likes gold. And then the biochar will suck up all the gold in the solution. Then, or we've been able to put nitrogen atoms on the surface of the biochar that like carbon dioxide. So you can use it to sequester or remove carbon dioxide from the air. So we're working on all kinds of different areas where we use biochar as a solid matter that can have a lot of really interesting properties and, and fun um, chemistry. So that pretty much covers it. We've looked at um, the different forms of matter. We've looked at all five that exist on Earth, but we focused on gases, liquids, and solids and connected that to the research that we're doing in our lab at Cape Breton University. And I would now be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much for that yeah. presentation. I, I honestly, sitting here, I learned a lot as well. Awesome. Uh, yeah, biochar is even more versatile than, than I initially thought. So that's that's very, very interesting. So what we will do here is I'll ask a few questions that we 
got from the uh, beforehand. Actually, you, you answered the majority of them. So I'll see if anyone put anything into the chat. Uh, let me just take a look at the chat right now. Uh, just one quick question from uh, ahead of time. Someone wants to know why are so many uh, chromium salts so colorful? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my periodic table if I can here. Um, and actually, whoever asked that question, they can go online to that periodic table, uh, interactive periodic table and read all about chromium. But chromium is not the only um, salt that is, that makes, uh, it's not the only transition metal that makes colorful salts. So chromium is a transition metal. So all these elements here in the pink blocks are transition metals. And transition metals don't necessarily behave the same as other elements because remember we showed the atom that has um, the orbitals around it? Well, the elements that are not in the transition block here, they only have the first two rows, uh, three rows, sorry, the first three rows only have um, S and P orbitals. They're a different kind of shape. They're, they sort of look like balloons um, that are tied together. The S orbitals are round and the P orbitals look like these little balloons. But the transition metals, they have a special kind of orbital called D orbitals. And these D orbitals are higher in energy and they're able to accept electrons. Um, more electrons, for example, than carbon or nitrogen or silicon or oxygen can, can accept. And so chromium is one of those transition metals. It's right here. And what happens is when chromium makes a molecule or a compound with other molecules from the that are made from the periodic table, it accepts electrons into its D orbitals. And that accepting of electrons makes that chromium go higher in energy. Okay, so it increases the energy. And the way we see the, the, the way we see color is by the absorption of certain um, wavelengths of color or light. And so by changing the energy of that metal by adding different kinds of molecules to that metal, making bonds to that metal, um, we change sort of the range in which the chromium is sitting on the energy levels and how much light it's allowed to absorb. And so, so for example, um, if you see, um, if you, if you add ligands that will help, if you add molecules to the chromium that will help it absorb yellow light, so it changes it to an energy level that helps it absorb yellow light, you might see a blue molecule because yellow uh, is absorbed, so therefore, therefore you'll see the blue light come through. Okay. Uh, so I have a few questions from the chat. A lot of people want to know a lot more about biochar. So the first question is, is biochar the same as charcoal? Basically it is. So biochar is made from biomass. So we, um, we make it from, that means it has to be made from something that is organic um, and is uh, uh, considered bio, bio decomposable or can decompose. It's made from something that's bioorganic and it's just, um, you're able to convert it all to carbon or char and a solid, a liquid and a gas. Um, but charcoal is, is a little bit, the, the term charcoal has a little bit more of a broader range. So charcoal traditionally comes from fossil fuels. It actually comes from coal, um, which is mined. And coal is organic in that it has come from um, the dinosaurs, <laughs> it's fossil fuels, right? Um, but it is, or plant matter, organics from a long, long time ago, but it also tends to have heavy metals that have settled into the organic matter and are trapped in there. Um, so coal, charcoal itself, um, is, is mostly something that you think about being generated from coal, whereas biochar is taking a biomass, so something like forestry waste or fish waste or even landfill, or sorry, even um, uh, the, you know, compost waste that you're, you're composting, something that's organic comes from. Okay. So I have a few questions here about electrons. So actually the first question is just about particles in general. So it's, uh, the question goes, do the particles in matter move randomly or is there a pattern? Yeah, so um, 
the particles move randomly and there is that um, we actually don't the Heisenberg principle tells us that we can't actually know how fast or the exact location of a particle at the same time and I think someone had asked about the boys Einstein uh, matter and why we describe it as a wave rather than a particle mm -hmm. that's because particles are constantly moving and that's how we understand um, ma matter and how we understand uh, atoms but in the boys Einstein matter condensates the part like the way we understand that is that the particles have lost all molecular motion or as much as physically possible and so then we have to describe it as a wave rather than a particle okay. all right uh, so another question here but uh, how large is a nanometer oh that's a great question so um, a nanometer is if you think about a, a meter stick, right? One nanometer is equal to one billionth of a meter. Okay. okay. <laughs> so zero point, I'll probably get it wrong. I think it's 10 to the minus nine yeah, meters. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, chat is filling up pretty quick. Let me see if I can find. Okay. So this question here is what happens when you add electrons to an atom? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's sort of how the periodic table works, right? So as you move across the periodic table, you are adding electrons to atoms. The atom is the smallest particle that we understand um, that makes up matter. And so the hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron, okay? And then the helium atom has two protons and two electrons. So you add it, if you take hydrogen, like if you take hydrogen atoms and you add electrons to them, then you are making new elements in the periodic table. Okay. Uh, so another question, how fast do electrons move? Yeah, I have no idea. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I could probably look it up for you, but that's a great question. That's great. Um, let me see what else. Uh, oh yeah, uh, this is a pretty interesting question about your research here. Um, how much biochar can your lab make per day on average? Oh, that's a great question. So we have the ability to make up to one ton a day of biochar, um, but we don't do that in the lab because that requires a great big pyrolysis unit. So we have access to a one ton a day unit outside of the lab. In the lab, we have two units, one that makes only a teeny tiny amount, about um, 100, um, 100 grams of biochar, which is like a pretty small amount, about you know the same amount that might be, that might fill this teeny cup right here. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have a unit that makes about um, 500 grams of biochar a day. So uh, we typically we typically make uh, about a kilogram of biochar in a day if we're running full tilt in the lab just for research purposes. But we can make up a to a ton a day outside of the lab. It's a great question. Okay, so we have a question here about the relationship between air pressure and velocity. So the question goes, why does air pressure increase when velocity decrease? Why does air pressure increase, increase when velocity decrease? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Okay. So, Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, no, that's, that's okay. See if um, whoever sent that question could, could clarify it a bit. That would be much appreciated. Um, what's over here? Uh, okay. All right, so the newest question just popped up. It says, if more electrons are added to an element, would it change the element completely or would it produce something else? I think you pretty much covered that when you're yep. saying yep. that's the, what happens when you add electrons. Yeah. So what's cool is that um, that's how chemistry works. So um, carbon atom has four electrons, right? And when it makes methane, which is carbon plus four hydrogen atoms, it is accepting four hydrogen electrons from the hydrogen atoms that make bonds around it. Now carbon is sharing those electrons with, um, with the carbon, hydrogen, carbon is sharing those electrons with the hydrogen atom, and that's a covalent bond. If you take, for example, a metal like sodium, um, sodium is willing to give up one of its electrons to exam for example to chlorine entirely so sodium will say here chlorine you can have this electron and it becomes positively charged and the chlorine atom accepts that electron 
and it becomes negatively charged and they make a compound and that compound is salt and there's but there's no sharing of electrons between them so the chlorine has accepted an electron uh, and just taken on a negative charge uh, so you, you mentioned about some of the possible applications of the of the products from 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 the forestry waste, right? Mm. So the question here is, is it possible to use that uh, bio oil in an automobile? Not yet, so um, hopefully someday. So the problem actually with forestry bio, bio oil is yeah, that acetic acid that I showed you. So remember um, this uh, image that showed the, some of the compounds that come from bio oil? Yeah. This acetic acid. Um, and there's other acids that are formed in, um, that are generated in the bio oil from forestry waste is really common in trees. And so when the tree structure breaks down, the, the organic structure of the tree breaks down and releases acetic acid. And the acid is really corrosive to the kinds of um, materials that we make cars out of. So we can't just put bio oil from forestry residues in cars because it would corrode the infrastructure that the car is made up of to burn the oil. But um, we also do, I didn't talk about this today, we also do work in the area of taking crab waste from the crabbing industry and making that into biochar, bio oil and biogas. And the bio oil that is made when you burn crab waste is actually basic and it doesn't have any acetic acid in it. And it's almost, it's just about a pH of nine. So it's almost neutral and it's, it has a much higher heating value, meaning it can be burned, almost burned in cars. So there's a lot more potential with waste that comes from shellfish than there is from forestry, forestry waste um, because it doesn't have that acetic acid compo component. But then again, the chemical industry is very interested in extracting that uh, acetic acid component from the bio oils of forestry residues. And when they do that, they still leave all the oil, um, all the products like these hydrocarbons that are good to burn in the oil. And then you can have two different streams of products from your forestry oil. So it's just a, just a matter of time, fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> Okay, so is, is it okay if I ask you two more questions? Yeah, for sure. Okay, perfect. So the first one is about quarks. Uh, you, you spoke about here about atoms, but uh, are, are quarks the smallest thing possible or? Um, quarks are smaller than atoms. Mm -hmm. There are some subatomic particles. So um, they don't have the, like, as a chemist, we mostly think of the atoms existing as the elements on the periodic table. Right. They're like whole Lego pieces. A quark is a, a smaller particle than an atom that they still make the quarks will make up the atoms, the atoms will make up the elements, um, but they don't have the full electrical charge that the atoms themselves will have. So they're not sort of neatly compacted into an atom with a nucleus and the neutron and the ele uh, electrons around the uh, nucleus. Um, they're much smaller. And I think that um, they have been like they're not, we've, we can see atoms. So we have microscopes now, which is just like within the last five years that allow us to actually visualize atoms. But I don't believe that the scientific field has been able to actually visualize quarks yet, but double check me on that one. I think it's just theoretical. Okay, okay so uh, one more question. Uh, you know, we, we, we spoke about the states of matter that we've found on earth and that we've created, right? Mm -hmm. So are there any states of matter that have been hypothesized or figured out outside of Earth? Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, but like even the, the boys einstein condensates were only hypothesized when I was most of the, the age of most of the people that are tuned in today. So that's really promising, right? If, if that kind of, of matter can be generated on Earth and hypothesized uh, in the, you know, 1920s and then, you know, 80 years, 90 years later, generated on Earth, then that's that's pretty cool. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And grandma, I, I have a lot to, to think about. I learned a lot here today. Good. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, so do you have any uh, parting words for uh, uh, our listeners? Um, no, I just, I'm really happy that I had the chance to talk to you all about matter and then connect it to my research. And I really encourage you all to, um, really pursue any areas of science that you 
find interesting and that you love and to find something that you can do the rest of your life and enjoy doing every day like I do with chemistry. All right, perfect. And with that, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Uh, apologize for not being able to get to all of your questions. But please feel, uh, feel free to email me any questions. I'm okay, happy perfect. to answer emails as well. Yep. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. So uh, what we will do this time, we will try to get these questions to um, uh, Dr. McQuarrie and she'll answer them. I know we get them back to you in our uh, newsletter. Awesome. Perfect. So we can deal. Perfect. All right. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Bye. Right. Bye.